Django Unchained's three major black characters, Django, Brumhilda, and Steven, feature racial characterization and narrative agency that is all over the map and filled with both positives and negatives. Django is an entertaining and intelligent gun-wielding hero who is somewhat overshadowed by a white savior narrative. Brumhilda's story depicts the suffering of African American slaves in a brutal and honest way, yet she is a damsel in distress whose suffering only serves to strengthen Django's resolve. Steven is a villainous intellectual match for Django, and his Uncle Tom mannerisms reframe decades of black stereotypes. But he also somewhat reinforces these stereotypes. While these characters comprise the core black cast, they share the screen with a host of supporting black characters, who, when viewed as a group, form their own depiction of black intelligence and agency that is primarily framed around the film's reverence for Django. There is an issue that pervades the film that is wrapped up in Django's characterization as a freed slave and cowboy, his presumed exceptionality among African Americans. When he and Schultz visit Candyland undercover as slavers to save Broomhilda, Django's independence and agency are initially questioned and later praised by Calvin Candy, the plantation owner. He refers to Django as Bright Boy and One in Ten Thousand. Well, I part company from many of my phrenologist colleagues is I believe there is a level above bright, above talented, above loyal that a nigger can aspire to. Say one nigger that just pops up in 10,000. The exceptional nigger. But I do believe that given time, exceptional niggers like Bright Boy here become, if not frequent, more frequent. Right, boy? You are that one in 10,000. In this scene, Canty is essentially saying that Django is superior to other less creative and less intelligent black slaves. Given the film's dismissal of other forms of racist rhetoric, this scene and line of dialogue appears, at first, to be just another example of Tarantino's elaborate characterization and ultimate condemnation of the film's villains and their perspectives on race. Intentionally or not, unlike other racist notions in the film, Django and Chain never actually outright dismisses Candy's idea. In fact, Tarantino's characterization of both Django and minor black characters throughout the film not only reinforces, but also appears to genuinely support this racist notion. You are that one in 10,000. At the start of the film, Schultz and Django first meet, after Schultz tracks down a duo of slavers that are taking Django and other slaves from a Mississippi auction. To the chagrin of the slavers, Schultz is more interested in conversing with the slaves than he is with their masters. Django is the only slave amongst his chain gang that speaks up and advocates for himself. He answers Schultz's questions and demonstrates a level of confidence the others lack. Once Schultz purchases Django, kills one of the two slavers overseeing the group, and cripples the other, the remaining slaves, or poor devils, do not take action to escape and kill the remaining crippled slaver until Schultz, a white man, specifically tells them to by literally talking down to them. You gentlemen have two choices. One, once I'm gone, you could lift that beast off the remaining speck, then carry him to the nearest town, which would be at least 37 miles back the way you came. Or two, you could unshackle yourselves, take that rifle, put a bullet in his head, bury the two of them deep, and then make your way to a more enlightened area of this country. Choice is yours. Oh, and on the off chance there are any astronomy aficionados amongst you, the North Star is that one. Ta-da! Nigga! Don't you touch my brother's coat! Django, on the other hand, does not seek permission before slamming his foot down on the slaver's injured leg, causing the man great pain. From the start of the film, it is clear that Django is not like other slaves, and that, unlike Django, other slaves in the film are passive until given direction. Other examples of black passivity and even unintelligence pervade the film. On one of Django's and Schultz's many adventures, Django must track down their targets on a large plantation with the help of a female house slave, Bettina. Through their interactions, she appears quite content with her master and enslavement. Additionally, her speech is loud, comical, and plain, and she comes off as rather simple-minded. 
That house we just left from is the big house. Big Daddy call it that because it's big. That there is the pantry. That's where Big Daddy hang all his dead meat. Polar squirrels. As sociologist Moon Karania states, black passivity in the film is funny. Her speech and body language are contrasted by Django's careful and more thoughtful word choices. What you want? I'm looking for three white men, three brothers, overseers. The name is Brittle. You know him? Brittle? Yes, Brittle. John Brittle, Ellis Brittle, Roger Brittle, sometimes called Lil' Raj. Bettina's characterization is not too far removed from the explicitly racist depiction of African Americans found in films like The Birth of a Nation, Gone with the Wind, and many classic Hollywood Western films. For a film marketed as a racially progressive Western film, this characterization of minor black characters is troubling, and the generalization of secondary black characters places Django on a pedestal as a paragon of the African race. There is one minor black character throughout the film who shows notable agency, D'Artagnan, whose actions occur off-screen. He chooses to run away instead of continuing to fight in Candy's Mandingo brawls. Go on, boy, finish it! Candy, Schultz, Django, and several fresh slaves find him trapped in a tree when they are on their way to Candyland. Ferocious hunting dogs circle the trunk. I'll be not ten. Now boy, why do a fool thing like run off? I can't fight no more, Monsieur Candy. Please, Monsieur Candy, I ain't got it. Ain't me no nah, more. Nah, 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 begging. I'm playing on my soft heart. In trouble now, son. <laughs> After a verbal confrontation with Django, Candy decides to let the dogs rip D'Artagnan apart as an example. You won't mind me handling this nigga any way I see fit. He's your nigga. Mr. Stone Cipher? That marsha and a bitch has sent D'Artagnan to nigga heaven. To test Django's resolve, Candy never looks away from Django's eyes once he gives the order and he watches Django's reaction to seeing a man ripped apart by dogs. Here, the one minor black character who shows agency is narratively punished by death for the act. Similar to the previously discussed violence against Broomhilda, D'Artagnan's murder is a double-edged sword in the film's narrative. On one hand, the act shows in honest and gruesome detail the horrors of slavery, particularly the use of hunting dogs to track and maim runaway slaves. However, narratively, the victimization of D'Artagnan is only meant to emotionally affect Django and Schultz's stories and to test their resolve. Candy staring into Django's eyes and watching his reaction to the murder is a test for Django, and as Candy toys with him, Django tries not to blow his cover. The use of Broomhilda's and D'Artagnan's suffering is not the character's only narrative similarity. For both characters, Django takes their revenge into his own hands. Much earlier in the film, and in the same sequence that features Bettina, Django and Schultz are on a different plantation searching for their bounties, the Brittle Brothers, three overseers who previously worked on the plantation at which Django and Brumhilda were enslaved. Once Django lays eyes on the brothers, the film cuts to a flashback sequence depicting the Brittles preparing Brumhilda to be whipped after she and Django were caught trying to run away. Like other examples of violence against her in the film, the whipping scene is not used to progress Broomhilda's story or evolve her as a character. She remains static before and after the whipping. Instead, it is used to emotionally traumatize Django. While Broomhilda is whipped, Django begs on his knees to the brothers, crying out for them to stop. John Brittle responds snidely, I like the way you beg, boy. After the flashback, Django kills the brothers in a western showdown, and as John dies, Django tells him, I like the way you die, boy. It's a heroic victory for the film's protagonist, and an entertaining western one-liner to watch Fox deliver. However, it also makes the scene less about Brumhilda and the whipping, and more about Django delivering his vengeance. It usurps the narrative weight of Brumhilda being whipped, ignores her closure and possibility for vengeance, and instead delivers the moment to Django. In the case of D'Artagnan, a man who was murdered while Django watched and did nothing, Django delivers his own brand of vengeance upon those who directly killed the slave. 
After escaping the mining company and riding back into Candyland, Jingle bursts down the door where the hunting dog's trainers live, shouts, and kills them all. It is another heroic moment for Django, and the shootout is once again entertaining. However, similar to Brumhilda, it usurps D'Artagnan's agency and revenge, and instead gives the narrative importance of the moment to Django. In the same manner as previously mentioned examples of minor black characters, including the slaves in chains at the start of the film, or Bettina, Brumhilda's whipping scene and D'Artagnan's death would not signify any part of a larger message in the film regarding Django's superiority to other African Americans if they were regarded as individual examples. However, because the film includes the notion of the 1 in 10,000 argument, and because it features so many scenes where Django is depicted as better than other slaves or shows him usurping their agency and revenge, Django Unchained, intentionally or not, formulates an argument that places Django above the worth of other black men and women. You're gonna have to excuse Mr. Stone Cypher's slack-jawed gaze. He ain't never seen a nigga like you ever in his life. For that matter, you don't have I.